That is excellent because that way we'll get through more and more questions. So thank you guys for that. You guys have done a, a very excellent job, very, very uh, articulate. So uh, starting the clock and let's jump to the first question. So uh, Mr. Cook Jr., thank you so much. Uh, we're going to read through the super chats first. Uh, thank you so much for your super chat, Mr. Cook Jr. Totally appreciate it. And uh, that really means a lot as we are kind of looking to improve on our software. So whew, the, uh, you know, I have to read this standing for truth. I know that you might not welcome it, but I have to be fair. He says, I don't want to be rude, but standing, you're not a scientist and you are extremely ignorant regarding what you're saying. Oh, and quit quoting Kent. So uh, we, as always, we'll give you a chance to respond and then we'll move to the uh, next question. Well, I think a lot of times when, you know, evolutionists can't actually address the evidence, for example, of, you know, genome-wide degradation, created heterozygosity hypotheses, just to name a couple, three major mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, a lot of the times they can only scoff, they can only provide logical fallacies. So at the end of the day, anybody looking objectively should be able to see that the evolutionist has absolutely no argument. Um, and a lot of times they'll say, hey, you're using Ken Hoven, you know, arguments, you're using Dr. Nathan. Daniel Jensen arguments, Dr. John Sanford arguments. I mean, evolution is just so easy to destroy. Pawns come to people evolution, um, that is. And you know what? If, if they want to believe that, say, dogs, banana plants, whales, and carrots are all related through common ancestry in light of the lack of evidence for it, that's fine with me. They have a right to their science fiction-based religion. But if they're going to come on and debate and provide yeah, nothing but logical fallacies, that's all, I can, uh, that's all I can say about that. Thanks, brother. So... Uh... Got your question, Frustrated Atheist. Thanks for your patience on that. I missed it the first time around. And also, uh, Tech Angel, thanks for subscribing. Glad to have you here. And for those of you who have subscribed earlier, I missed it. Uh, but I want to say thanks for subscribing and being a part of the community. We're glad to have you here. Whether you're Christian or atheist or one of the many strange creatures in between, we're glad you're here. So uh, next, Jeremy Ike, 61944 asks, Ask Patient Beard how DNA uh, codons evolved and organized themselves into threes or three codons without a designer. And so let's see. And, it, and he's basically saying he wants empirical evidence. So uh, we'll go with that. So thank you for that question, Jeremy. And if you want, I can read it again because... That's a, a mindful for me too. So, but if you got it, Jared, you can answer. Um, well, um, I'm not claiming to be any kind of an expert in biology, uh, or, or you know, any kind of expert, you know, in in any kind of very specific specialized field of uh, evolution. Um, I've done a lot of research uh, on the broad strokes so i guess the best answer i could give you is is I, i'm not sure I, I don't know you'd have to ask a microbiologist or, or somebody who studies that specifically um and e even if it you know it, it, it still doesn't demonstrate that there had to be some kind of intelligence just just because it did actually evolve or just because it's here Gotcha. So next question. And that, I thought, uh, James, are we getting to respond to some of them? You can. Yeah, that's you guys both said you were OK with it. So it's fine. I'll make it short and sweet. I think it comes down to, you know, Occam's razor. I think it's it's obvious evidence for design. Maybe it goes back to Second Peter three. I'm not too sure. Look at alternative splicing. You know, RNA can be spliced together in different ways to make different proteins. In this way, a single gene can give rise to tens of thousands of different proteins, and many of these proteins are tissue specific. So, at the end of the day, this these three codons that that uh, Jeremy asked Patient Beard here, they're highly organized and only a an amazing God can organize such complexity. So that's all I have to say. Unless the other genes just weren't as good and died we gotta out. Stick, forgive me, just so we don't get into conversation, we've got to keep <laughs> going to the next question. So Saint Dragon asks, hey, Standing for Truth, how come Christians prior to the 19th century never hold to the young earth creation view? Well, I, I think if you look at all the all the different writings of, you know, say the church fathers quote 
unquote, or um, look at, you know, writings from Martin, Martin Luther, you know, you'll find that a lot have held to a literal in, interpretation of, of Genesis, obviously. So I think that that's just a, a misunderstanding and a, and a misrepresentation. So you can certainly go do your due diligence and, and read into this. But I think anybody, you know, with half a brain and, and one eye can, can read the, the Genesis account, for example, and conclude, you know, a, a young creation. Um, they can conclude that according to Genesis, you know, apes and man are not related through common ancestry. And they can also conclude a, a global flood. And the fact that Second Peter says that in the last days there's going to be scoffers denying those three things. Well, the evidence, once again, from the Bible and science, empirical science, is consistent with, uh, um, with a literal interpretation of Genesis. Except that Genesis 1 doesn't agree with Genesis 2, so... <laughs> That's all the answer I have to that question. Well, I could answer that, but oh, I don't think that that's the format here. I know you got an answer. Sorry, Standing. I hate to cut don't, you off. I'll, I'll uh, refrain. <laughs> don't, don't worry. You'll get to talk uh, a, a lot because you got a lot of questions for you. So, uh, Brett Bernhoft, thanks for your question. He says, I have a question for this show. Oh, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. I think he, he means Standing for Truth, though. So, he says, if Christians agree with evolution as a force of God... What role does free will have in this process? Uh, Brett, let me know if I was wrong about thinking that's for standing for truth, um, it, just in case, but I, my guess is it's for standing. So go ahead, standing. I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat that question, uh, James? Yeah, he had said, if Christians agree with evolution as a force of God, what role does free will have in this process? Sure. Well, I mean, once again, we have to uh, define whether, you know, what evolution means. No one disagrees with natural selection and, and random variation, random mutations change over time. So I'm sure we've all gotten that by now. Um, and it, it, if I think that the big word there is if, because if you're going to look at Genesis and, and take a literal view on it, uh, for one, Genesis has been proven as uh, contrary to patient beard uh, has said, you know, I have sufficiently provided a, a strong biblical model that makes testable predictions in regards to free will. If, um, you know, that type of fish to fisherman evolution is true. I'm not too sure. I certainly believe in, in free will, but you know, I don't believe that that's the case. I believe um, Genesis in the entire Bible is, is quite clear that um, that type of evolution is not true according to the Bible and empirical you evidence. To be um, forgive me. Um, so I'm not too sure how to answer the free will part though. Gotcha. So, uh, Jared, if you want to respond in a pithy way. Okay, you got it. James Downard asks, methods question to standing for truth. Do you fact check the source claims from the creationists you copy? And if so, please offer an example of what you did. Okay, uh, thanks for the, um, the question. All the... Um... If you look at my slides, I had sources, papers um, that you can go to. Um, if, if he's looking um, for specific sources, I, I do source check. Um, you can look at the uh, secular journals that this came from. I'll use one example, for example. Uh, mammoth populations were highly inbred and carried a, an elevated um, genetic load, likely contributing to their extinction, right, due to this mutational meltdown. So if you look at the source and, and you do your source check, uh, this is exactly what it's saying. I'm um, sure the, the evolutionist is not going to agree that, okay, you know, genetic entropy disproves, um, you know, universal common descent and, and, and proves um, a biblical-based model. They might just um, resort to, oh, well, this is inbreeding. But at the end of the day, you know, inbreeding is like a sneak preview of where we are going genetically as a species. So, sure, they're not going to have the same conclusion because we have different worldviews, but the sources are um, – not being misrepresented as, as James Downard would have us believe. Thank you. Next question. We have, uh, thanks for that question, James, and thanks for the response. Standing, we have the broken God asks, question for standing for truth. Can you demonstrate genetic entropy between the Iceman frozen about 4,000 years ago and modern humans by examining the sequenced genomes? 
Well, for one, the thesis of genetic entropy would be based on mutation accumulation. You know, we're inheriting 100 to 300 new mutations per person per generation. So we're accumulating these mutations. This genomic wide degradation would be at its worst now. So if we're looking at an ice man from thousands of years ago, I mean, I don't know why we would expect that, you know, he would be under more significant genomic degradation than, than modern humans today. So, I mean, that's kind of a, a silly question. But as I've demonstrated before, you can look at early human populations such as um, Homo um, neanderthalensis. You know what I mean? They were highly inbred. They had a very high genetic load, 40% less fit than, than modern humans. And this severe genetic degeneration probably contributed to the disappearance of of that population and all these early human populations are consistent with um, dispersion after Babel and isolation of populations and these genetic mistakes were uh, revealed so certainly consistent with uh, biblical based model thanks James gotcha thank you for that and let's see next we have uh, Stevie I'll be right with your concern uh, and Riley just uh, one second I'm gonna ask the next question so James Downard has a question, and that is for Standing for Truth. Does S, uh, Standing for Truth think the, forgive me if I don't pronounce this right, proba, probanogonathids were deliberately designed as a separate kind? And if so, why did God make them to match the evolutionary prediction of them? Well, I think if you look to the model of pre-existing heterozygosity and depending on how many created kinds that God actually created and based on um, the segregation of these gene variants, recombination, mutations, there would have been such immense variety that if you're going to look at all these um, creatures, all this variety, this biodiversity. I mean, the evolutionists can certainly look at it in, in their biased worldview and based on their primary assumption that universal common ancestry is true and conclude that, you know, where can we fit this? What kind can we fit this? But as I said before, you know, we have to look at um, genetic data and, and that's what we're doing right now. You know, if we're only in um, the infancy of um, understanding the DNA language. So once we once we can sufficiently prove that, say, say across families, that these DNA differences are functionally unique, then we can start separating and distinguishing between kinds. You know, who's who's related and who's not related. So um, that would be my answer. Gotcha. Thank you for that. And next, CRISPR CAS9 asks. He says, uh, genetic. Let's see. It's not quite a question, forgive me. I think the next two we actually have, we have one for patient beard and one for uh, standing for truth nut that aren't quite questions. Uh, if, you, if you're able to put it in the form of a question, CRISPR, I can uh, kind of bump you to the front uh, since you, I didn't state the rules at the start. Sorry about that. Jeremy Ike. 6 1944 asked patient beard how meiosis evolved and cut the dna content by half during fertilization i and uh i hope i didn't ask that again he's saying like, i'm gonna give you... i'm gonna give the same answer as the last complicated biological question that you know i i think it's just kind of a repeat you're just asking about a different part of the you know body that evolved or a different a different step in the evolutionary process that evolved um and i'm not a microbiologist so i i can't give you the nitty-gritty details on it you'd have to seek an answer from one of them gotcha thank you for that and... I'll, I'll respond i'll respond just 10 seconds to that i think once again you know obviously this um amazing an obvious design and, and on a surface level if, if you're looking through a microscope at, at say a cell is some of it might be messy but it's the intricate details of it and based on our genome based on the fact that you know we know that uh, the genes play roles in, in multiple overlapping codes this profoundly reduces the probability of, of beneficial mutations so at the end of the day it all comes back to the fact that yes, evolution is falsified and the complexity of, of our DNA code is is true. Um, we should recognize, you know, our, our amazing designer for um, what he has created. So maybe it goes back to second Peter three again. I'm not too sure. Thanks, James. Gotcha. And next question, James Downard 
he asks, do you claim any creationist documented these alleged degeneration and time track to 4,500 years ago for all the other animals allegedly on the ark? I'm sorry, can you, can you just repeat that? I'm sorry. Uh, he says, do you claim that creationists documented these alleged degenerations and time track of to 4,500 years ago for all the other animals allegedly on the ark? Well, I think you can look at mitochondrial DNA rates, for example, and you can see that based on the uh, mitochondrial DNA differences, it's more so consistent with a, um, a, a young genome, for example, and um, evolutionists have actually over-predicted the DNA differences in the mitochondrial uh, DNA and under-predicted the differences in uh, nuclear DNA. So I think if, if we're looking at DNA differences as a measure of time, um, that would be more consistent with with a biblical based model. If we're looking at genetic entropy and the accumulation of uh, genetic mistakes or uh, genetic mutations, you know, I'm, I'm sure we can track that back. Even through the fossil record, you can see that everything was bigger, everything was better. You know, you can look at um, certain animals, uh, even look at a, a megalodon shark versus, say, a great white shark today. Obviously, something was different. Um, you hear legends of, of the golden age. Um, so I think genetic mutation accumulation, take that back in time and it fits like a glove. I'm not sure if, you know, creationists are identifying exact, um, you know, creative kinds and, and how much accumulation and mutations was in their genome. But I think the evidence is pretty consistent. Thanks, James. Gotcha. And next one is from CRISPR CAS9. This is for Standing for Truth. He says, uh, epigenetic regulation requires underlying epigenetically responsive genetic elements. And given that, uh, that these are subject to mutation, how can that not be open to evolution? Well, epigenetics, for example, you can look at it as outside the genome. It's, it's the study of, um, of changes in, in these species or even in living organisms, but it's caused by modification of gene expression as compared to um, the alteration of the actual um, genetic code itself. So if you look into epigenetics, it's a lot of it is, most of it actually is, is evidence for um, biblical creation, uh, to be honest with you, because a lot of these changes, a lot of these, uh, a lot of this adaptation is, is based on um, epigenetic regulation. And at the end of the day, we are seeing genomic degradation on all levels, even on, um, epigenetic levels because a lot of these we know autism's on the rise cancers autoimmune diseases and it's hard to say that these are all um, solely based on mutation accumulation and a lot of it's probably based on epigenetic um, degradation as well so once again epigenetics is more consistent with uh, with my model versus the evolution of model i can hear a lot of typing there but sorry about that no, no problem that's gotcha. the end of my uh, answer there you got it and thanks for your patience with me uh basically i admit i missed your question saint dragon but riley s to the rescue riley says uh standing for tr or on behalf of so this is originally saint dragon's question for saint uh, standing for truth how come some early church fathers like irenaeus justin martyr augustine of hippo origin Clement of Alexandria didn't take the day of Genesis literally. I'd have to look at all the writings, just like any argument. So, for example, let's look at a you know a Protestant versus a Catholic debate. You can see in the cross examination examination section, you know, the Catholic apologist is bringing up all these quotes from certain church fathers, and the Protestant apologist is bringing up certain quotes from other. Uh, uh, church fathers. So at the end of the day, there's arguments from both sides and we got to look at it as, as a whole. Um, but at the end of the day, just open up your Bible, uh, read what, what the Bible clearly says about a, a young creation, about uh, obviously a global flood. And, and the fact that it's obviously not teaching that man who was made in the image of God is related to, um, you know, a chimpanzee or, or a gorilla. So um, that'd be my answer. Gotcha. Thanks for your uh, question there, St. Dragon, and thanks for the help, Riley S. And TomTom34B asks, good to see you, TomTom. Question for Standing for Truth. 
What would falsify the creation model or hypothesis slash claim? Well, I, I think, for example, if you could actually find a way to solve this um, this genome-wide degradation, because we know that beneficials cannot keep up with uh, deleterious mutations, and, and we know there's um, a phenomenon called selection interference. These near neutrals should be virtually unstoppable. So if that problem could actually be sufficiently addressed, which I've had many debates and, um, you know, maybe some of the more evolutionary heavyweights, say from the non sequitur show, if, if they want to step away from their comfort zone and come debate me on this and show me why, you know, genetic entropy is false, I'd love to do that. You know, you got someone like Paul Gia making a video, but he won't come out and actually have a debate on it. So that's very telling. So that would falsify the theory. And if you, like I said already four times, I mean, the created heterozygosity hypotheses created DNA differences. We look to the to the genome for, function, for functionality. So if the majority of the genome is just useless evolutionary junk, or these pseudo genes are, are proven sufficiently to be, um, you know, a genomic fossils, then that would falsify at least that form of, of hypothesis as well. But at the end of the day, the, the biblical model is adaptable. So um, some may be falsifiable and, and others, we could certainly adapt uh, it given the data. You betcha. Thank you very much for that question, Tom Tom, and thanks to Andy for Truth. So Iron Charioteer asks, ask both debaters, what is the explanation for iridium layer in the geostrata caused by the asteroid 65 million years ago. He yes. said first. He said for both of, of the debate, he, he can start if he wants. I gotta. Okay. Can, can you repeat that question? One more time? Since Jared hasn't talked for five minutes, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so, uh, Iron Charioteer asks. Both debaters, what is the explanation for the iridium layer in the geostrata caused by the asteroid 65 million years ago? Um, I'm going to just go ahead and take his word that it was caused by an asteroid 65 million years ago. Like It sounded like a self-answering question. Did I misunderstand that? It might be. Uh, I think you probably probably agree on the age of the Earth. So ask both uh, debaters what's the explanation of the and iridium is I R I, almost like the start of the word iris. So iridium layer in the geostrata caused by the asteroid 65 million years ago. It sounds like the asteroid caused uh, an iridium layer. Um, I, I I don't know what what specifically. I'm assuming it was probably an iridium uh, heavy asteroid that ended up uh, dispersing across the planet after it hit. That's be my best guess. I'm I, I haven't really researched the, uh, that specific topic. I, I'd have to I'd have to look that up a little more to give you a specific answer. I think I think the answer is pretty simple in a biblical based model. Geologic activity during the flood is is readily explainable given a, a catastrophic plate tectonic model. You know. Um, that can produce iridium, say, through um, volcanoes, because this model, uh, this CPT model, has um, tons of volcanic activity associated with it, well, worldwide volcanic activity with it, actually. So there's actually nothing in the record that can't be readily explained through this, through this model. Thanks, James. You bet. And next up, Iron Tier Tier. Oh. You just asked that, sorry. Okay. Uh, Tom Jump asks, question for standing, what is the rate of genetic decay? So the rate of genetic decay, you can actually, it's not really um, contested anymore that, you know, we inherit uh, 100 to 300 mutations per person per generation. That means, you know, I'm more mutant than... Um, then my grand, my children are going to be more mutant consistently than I am. So it's it's the accumulation. I mean, this generation alone has seen 700 billion mutations um, because there's 7 billion people on the planet. And the fact that most of these mutations are actually in the non-selection zone, once again, demonstrates sufficiently the fact of, of, of genetic entropy. Um, I imagine now that the... The, the, whether the rates are increasing, but I know that, you know, post-creation, um, it, it would have been slower 
and we can see that with the ages. And post flood, it, it would have been faster based on the environmental changes um, post flood. So that's my answer. Gotcha. Next question. Thanks so much for your super chat, Sheep Work. Totally appreciate your support. And uh, Sheep Work, if, you, if anybody was uh, watching the other day, it was uh, we had a debate on whether or not Christians keep the Old Testament law of the Tanakh, whether they should. And uh, sheep, sheep Work was Aaron in that debate. So good to see you, Aaron. And he asks, what takes more faith, evolution, or intelligent design, which could include a form of evolution? Would that be uh, for patient beard or myself first? I think it's for both of us. It My guess like. is maybe both. You can start uh, if you want, brother. I, I, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I would say that um, it, it takes a lot of faith to believe in intelligent design, um, especially uh, standing for truth's uh, model because he hasn't presented one. Um, Evolution is uh, a theory, and we call it a theory because it's it's had evidence that has supported it for well over 200 years. Um, and as I said earlier, um, our ability to verify scientific theories is in their ability to produce uh, uh, predictable produce reliable predictions about reality, which translates into things like technology and, you know, uh, other, uh, other knowledge improvements that we can use in our day-to-day -day life. And like I mentioned earlier, we know more about evolution than we know about uh, electricity and magnetism. And, and we use electricity and magnetism for, you know, to, to build computers and, and the internet and all this fun stuff that, that we're talking to each other on. So, um, I don't think it takes evidence, or I'm sorry, I don't think it takes faith to believe in evolution because we have evidence uh, and we have predictions that have been made by the model uh, that, uh, and we, it, it, there's, there's been nothing in over 200 years that has falsified it. So since evolution is the evidence-based position, it does not by definition require faith. Well, I, I, I appreciate Patient Beard's great zeal for his science fiction based religion of pawns come to people evolution. But at the end of the day, the evolutionists have nothing but rescue device after rescue device. They can't explain this level of design that we see in nature, that we see in the genome. And neo-Darwinism lacks incredible explanatory power in regards to the origin of, you know, phenotypic complexity, anatomical novelty, and the origin of non-gradual modes of transition, for example, abrupt fossil appearance. You know, I want to hear an explanation. On, on the Cambrian explosion, for example. So at the end of the day, if you're going to go from your single-celled organism to your multi-celled organism to your fish, amphibian, reptile, um, you're going to have to show me, you know, incredible increases in novel information. And you know, dogs produce dogs, elephants produce elephants. You can believe that dogs and elephants and banana plants are related through common ancestry, but that's not science. And I think that takes a great deal of faith. Um, to believe something like that, and I think patient Beard has, um, no, has really no demonstrated that science disagrees with the state of dogs so produce dogs. So let's see. So uh, just to keep the conversation going, so we basically Tom Jump asks. Uh, let's see, he so he's got a, a tripart tripartite or trifecto follow up. So. Uh, thanks again for your help, Sheep Work. Glad to have you here. And Tom Jump, thanks for your question. His second is, is the rate of decay faster for asexual organisms? And that is for uh, standing for truth. Is the rate of decay for asexual organisms faster? That's all right. I'd, I'd have to look at that um, specifically to um, see what, what the rate of decay on... Um, on say asexual organisms are so i mean at the moment i don't really have a, a quick answer for that gotcha then uh science enthusiast i think you're familiar with him standing for truth he said he asked why do humans have the gene in their dna to produce egg yolk <laughs> so i'm not too sure when he actually got into the debate but i love that he brought that up since i actually uh, specifically address that. So scientists are finding that numerous of these so-called genomic fossils are actually not pseudo after all, and these genes are necessary and required to sustain healthy life processes 
um, in the cell. So the broken remnants of an ancient um, chicken gene, the egg yolk gene, um, you know, no such remnant exists. And instead, the fragment appears to actually be a functional um, DNA element. You can look at the beta globin uh, pseudogene, some of the whale pseudogenes, the gulo pseudogene. The gulo pseudogene might actually be a broken gene. But at the end of the day, you know, I know people who have had a Chevy Cruze and, and a Honda Civic, and the air conditioner broke in the exact same way in both cars. Wow, that proves that they both evolved from a sp skateboard billions of years ago. I mean, that's how silly they are. And science enthusiasts, I got a debate with him on my channel. Go watch it. it it was fun i would love to do it again so it maybe he maybe he had his fingers in his ears when he heard me explain the ancient chicken gene example but pseudo genes junk dna overturned no, none of what you said really made any sense there um i but, wouldn't expect it to make sense to you no okay well um anyway uh, that's that that, that that chicken gene that's that's kind of how uh, we we notice uh, large changes in, in species is we have a, a gene that will get broken. Um, oftentimes it'll be duplicated uh, and then one of them will be uh, broken through a mutation and then over time uh, and generations uh, a, a different mutation will turn that gene on and it will do something different. Um, that's, that's just a natural part of evolution and, and that's just plain evidence of, of common descent is that, you know, we, we can look back and we can see that these things are identical. Yeah, I, ju I just debunked that, but okay, continue. Actually, how much longer uh, do we have there, uh, James? Let's see. Uh, as of now, we got about six minutes. So we've got, uh, if we can keep being as short and pithy as possible, we'll keep trying to get through them. We've got a lot left. They just love you guys. So Tom Jump asks, uh, we got that one, and he asked another one for standing for truth. He said, with that rate of decay, uh, well, you didn't give an answer to that, um, so it kind of doesn't quite work. Sorry, Tom. Uh, let's see. He would have said, with that rate of decay, how many generations will it take until life is no longer possible? And sorry again, Tom, he, uh, I think he said he just wants to read more on that or something to that effect. Uh, Harry... Thanks for your question, Harry. Glad you're here. He asks, Patient Beard, what he thinks of Christian evolutionists. What do I think of Christian evolutionists? Yep. Um, I'm, I'm just assuming he's talking about Christians who believe in evolution and an old earth. Yeah. Um, I think that um, if they're the type that seek the truth and are always researching, uh, I would call them future atheists. That's just a personal opinion. That that's part of that's part of what led me down down my road. That it's so much angry God the Bible, but yeah, I, I would I would tend to agree with that. Theistic evolutionists are just one step closer to atheistic evolution, evolutionism. And I just don't understand based on, you know, what we know about empirical data, based on, um, say, mutations and natural selection, the proposed mechanisms for this type of large scale evolution. And, and when you look at the fact that these influx of deleterious mutations and, and maybe a one or two rare occurrences of a beneficial mutation, I mean, there's no way that that can compensate for the information loss. So there's just so much evidence against ponds come to people evolution that theistic evolutionists i think most of them just don't really look at the data and they kind of just want to fit in with um you know with the scientific community um quote unquote but there's no evidence to support the theory so that's why it's not even a good hypothesis it's it's just a religion at the end of the day gotcha and next uh <laughs> jared having a snack you it reminds me of one time oh patrick ripped in you for that <laughs> you remember patrick all right sorry mm -hmm. back to the questions okay john peterson asks standing for truth could you please give a brief synopsis of your curriculum vitae or cv uh thanks i'm sorry can a brief so, synopsis of my what Curriculum vitae, like uh, basically, it's like the academic version of like a resume. So, uh, saying, could you please give a brief synopsis of your uh, basically like academic resume? So my What's their scientific credentials. 
my scientific credentials, my academic resume would be um, I've, I've studied science in college. I've, um, I've, I've taken five years of, of post-secondary um, education. I've studied extensively um, on the creation evolution um, debate and, and controversy. Um, I've, I've written, a, I've read a multitude of, of scientific papers. I think I understand it well. I think I understand it more than well enough to understand the major flaws and major problems with um, with the theory itself. And, and also, I understand, you know, the um, I guess evidence for say biblical creation based on a literal interpretation of of Genesis. I don't think it's necessary to say exactly what I took in school. I mean, I think it's um, I don't think it's necessary in regards to the debate. But that'd be my answer. Thanks. You got it. And thanks so much for your super chat. Sheep work just came in and he asks, does evolution have any problems? Uh, he wants an answer from both. And he says, be honest. So uh, we, whichever one wants to start. Thanks for that again, Aaron. Totally appreciate it. Well, I'll, I'll start by saying that um, what we have for evolution and what we have in terms of evidence um, makes it a very strong theory and it's such a strong theory that science treats it as a fact. Um, I don't know of any problems with evolution that I could bring up off of the top of my head, but I know that um, a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me have uh, come to some conclusions and other people who are sm smarter than them have not been able to disprove them on it. Um, and like I said, at, at the end of the day, uh, the model best explains reality. And we, we have successfully used that model to make predictions about reality. So b based on our ability to use the model, um, I, I would say it's, it might not be perfect. Nothing is, but it's the best one we have. And it, it gives us the best results when we compare it to reality. I, I would say that, you know, it's not even a good hypothesis. I mean, there's absolutely no evidence for it. All, all the evidence that you get from say mutation related changes or, um, there are decay of prior information. You're not going to get um, your fish to fishermen that way. I mean, one strong example is uh, linkage groups, Muller's ratchet. I mean, mutations in linkage groups, for example, they're, they're linked basically forever. Um, and so if you have lots of bad mutations, say in that linkage group, that means that linkage group is reducing in fitness continuously based on, you know, as I've talked about accumulating deleterious mutations and say you throw in one or two beneficials, just, you know, give it to the atheist so they'll stop complaining. They're just going to get neutralized by the large numbers of deleterious ones. So this linkage, you know, one of many evidence is actually a killer and an absolute destroyer for uh, particles to people evolution. This means that every linkage block is degenerate. So just one of many evidence against the, uh, um, you know, religion. Gotcha. So we, next we have Tyler Durden asks, how does standing for truth? Oh, Zach W. Thanks for subscribing, buddy. Glad to have you here. No matter what your worldview is, we are, uh, shooting for a diverse community. So glad you're here. And Tyler Durden asks, how does standing for truth compare the DNA of dogs and wolves to determine that they are related and why wouldn't the same technique work to show broad common ancestry? Sure. So you would look at um, the genetic differences, the DNA differences, whether you're looking at the mitochondrial DNA differences or the, um, um, say, the nuclear DNA differences. And in, in depending on the, um, whether it's low genetic diversity or, or lots of differences uh, between them, um, ultimately, the simple answer would be gene sequencing. Um, and, and I think it's empirically evident that, you know, wolves and domestic dogs are related based on the, the, the evidence, but there's no way to infer or extrapolate that to mean that, you know, dogs and banana plants are related. And that's why I say evolution, you know, the evolutionists, they hope, they imagine, and it, it, just like my, um, uh, my logo says, you know, just imagine, because there's a whole lot of imagination taking place in the mind of, of the evidence. So the short answer, gene sequencing, genetic differences, crossbreeding, that's how you're going to get your, uh, uh, your conclusion. Gotcha. 
And next we have Jim Majors. Thanks so much for your super chat. Totally appreciate it. Glad to have you here. And uh, Jim Majors is also a past debater. We've had him here. And so uh, that was an epic night with him and Jonathan Sheffield. And by the way, hold on, if I can plug this, like, I, I'm so excited for it. Jim Majors is coming back this Friday, and it's going to be to debate. He's defending his and his colleagues' organization, the Atheist Republic, the biggest atheist organization on the planet, I've heard. He's defending the organization against Max Dean Esme. Red Pill Religion will be back and he will be with Deflating Atheism, Rob from Deflating Atheism. So that is going to be epic. And uh, so, again, thanks for your super chat, Jim. And Jim's uh, question was, for a standing for truth, he says, molecular biology can identify when species deviate from ancestors like whales evolved from terrestrial herbivores 50 million years ago. Can your model stand to these standards? Well, the thing is, you know, what he says there, let's say if you're looking at uh, the fossil evidence, well, it's just circumstantial evidence requiring an actual theory to account for it. And what we know about genetics disproves that right off the bat. And uh, molecular analysis, if you look at the protein Preston, that actually puts whales and dolphins squarely with the bats. It's something called convergent evolution, which technically just... Um, has to do with inconsistencies and in, in the lack of unique, uniqueness of this phylogenetic tree. So then they try and explain these inconsistencies using the rescue device of, uh, of convergent evolution, right? The appearance of the same trait or character in independent lineages. So in, in regards to whales, whales, dolphins, and bats, they're the only mammals that have echolocation systems, James. So on the basis of even just gross anatomy, the whales and dolphins would be classified closer to the cow than to bats. So on the basis of their, you know, echolocation systems, they actually belong with the bat. So strong evidence that this phylogenetic tree doesn't actually represent objective reality and actually falsifies universal common descent. So these bones found in the dirt, I'm not sure how they're interpreting them, but um, it's, it's circular because it's based on an assumption that this, this theory is true and what we know about it is that it's not true. So thanks. Gotcha. And thank you very much, Justin James Hooman. Totally appreciate your super chat and glad to have you here. So uh, he actually has a question for Standing for Truth. How did carnivores, carnivorous plants, forgive me, how did carnivorous plants arise? So carnivorous plants, um, it, I mean, it, I think it all comes back to a biblical based model and that, you know, pre fall, pre fall, everything was um, was perfect. And after the fall introduced death, decay. So whether carnivory, you know, in regards to animals or, or plants um, occurred after this fact, I don't think it's it's really a, a problem at all, say given a, the assumption of, of a biblical based model, but it definitely occurred after after the fall, along with all other death and decay. And since that's what we see in the universe and in the genome, I mean, wow, what more of a biblical model do you need? So thanks. Next we have Tyler Durden and he says, ooh, this is a simple question for Standing for Truth. What created kind is a rotifer? And let's see, if you don't know what a rotifer is, you're in good company. I have no <laughs> idea what a rotifer is, but I'm pulling up a picture. Um, Does patient beard know what a rotifer is? Let's see. Um, so well, it's I basically... I could Google it, but I probably um, know what it's a common ancestor is. I'm on my other laptop, or basically, like, if you can imagine a microscopic... Uh, a phy rotifer. Like, uh, <laughs> microscopic phylum and basically like a translucent, you know what I mean when I say microscopic, uh, that, uh, I'm on the other laptop pulling it up. Sorry about that. It's, 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 it's just, uh, so if you're familiar with Rodifer's, um, uh, standing for truth, his question again, just a quick read it. So yeah, I'm not too sure what kind Rodifer's are in, but that doesn't prove that Rodifer's in, 
uh, carrots and apples and whales are all related through common ancestry. So I'll, I'll look into that one and, and see if I can give them an answer. But that doesn't really help, I think, either model. Gotcha. And with that, we he, have... He, he asked what, what kind it was. He didn't ask which model it supported. We're just about out of time. But um, if let me read the question over again just so that uh, if I did make a mistake with that. I want to make sure I got it right. So uh, let's see. What, oh, he said, what created kind is a rotifer? Well, it sounds like it's a, it's a, it's a type of microscopic um, it's pretty wicked animal looking. that is found in freshwater environments. And um, let me see. Yeah, I'm not too sure. I'll, I'll, I'll give the last words to Patient Beard here if he'd like, and then I think we can call it a night. It's been a lot of fun. It's 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 a part of the it's the, a part of the unseeable kind because when the Bible was written, they couldn't see it. Or we could put it in there with witchcraft and the other things that made you sick why, when you didn't understand it. It's one of those kinds. Hey, like I said, I appreciate your great zeal for your science fiction based religion, but so you can keep believing to, dogs and banana plants are related through common ancestry. It's not science, brother. It's just not we've science. Got to wrap up, we totally appreciate both speakers. We appreciate all of your questions, everybody. Totally. Uh, thanks for your super chat support as well. And every other way, I have to be honest, this channel, the reason it's good, well, first, I have to say thank you so much to Jared and to Standing for Truth. The channel is like run on the research by the people who come on here and share the ideas and so uh this is really i can't say thank you enough for you guys and also for your questions and let's see let's see uh i hate to ask them to go over john i understand that like i know we want to get to more questions it's just that um, to respect their time like they've already given a lot and standing for truth is ahead of me I'm in mountain time and so it's really late so I'm just kind of like uh, I know it's getting pretty late and they might have to get up for work so I, forgive me but I want to say thank you so much for our speakers we did do the whole 37 minutes and 5 seconds because Jared donated time to the Q&A so um, <laughs> that was a, a really fun Q&A and so thank that might you have been the best question and answer yet yeah, that was really exciting. So we totally appreciate it. And we are excited. We've got a lot of debates coming up to this week. In particular, we've got debates on God's existence, I think for sure, uh, tomorrow. And then we've got another debate this Friday. And we might have one on Saturday, one of which might even have Standing for Truth and a controversial guest and uh, as well as two atheists or, or skeptics who will be defending as well. So that's going to be uh, very exciting as well. And whether you're, if this is your first time here, I want to say thanks for coming by. We are looking for diversity. So if you are like, hey, uh, like, I don't know if I agree with any of these people, maybe you're a Scientologist. But we're happy you're here because we don't have any Scientologists. We, we will basically... We like to have diversity and we like to have people with different questions. And so this isn't like, a, you know, hey, we're going to make fun of Scientology. We're like, hey, we're glad you're here if you're a Scientologist. There are, uh, I don't think we have any Scientologists. We've got, once in a while, we've got Ocean, who's a polytheist. We've got, uh, I think we are going to have a Satanist on soon as well. And so trying to uh, kind of not become an echo chamber, that's a big deal to us. So anyway. Thank you guys very much for being here again. The debaters, it's it's all you guys, and I'm confident. Hopefully, we'll get to have both of them back if they're willing. And uh, mm -hmm. um, they've been friends of the channel and super supportive of the channel, so I can't thank them enough. Uh, their links are in the description, folks. Check them out. If you're like, man, I just can't stand that standing for truth. <laughs> well, you know they what? Love you, don't they? <laughs> they, you know what? You you got like a you got away with the atheist standing for truth. They just, uh, you know, a lot of them they're they're firing a lot of questions at you today. Well, you know what? Well, I was receiving too many emails that they were having SpongeBob SquarePants nightmares. 
And I love the evolutionists, you know what I mean? I mean, sure, they, they believe in, in an absolutely ridiculous um, religion. But at the end of the day, I, I changed my picture just for them. I don't want them to have nightmares anymore, James. So. We'll, give, we'll give Jared and uh, Stanley for Truth, like, uh, any last words before you go? Uh, yeah, I have, I have one last thing to say. Uh, uh, John Peterson asked in the chat, if nonsense is water, how many Olympic swimming pools uh, would Standing for Truth's arguments fill? Uh, and my answer to his question is, is it would be water on a biblical proportion. Those are my final words. Have a good night. My final words would be, I think anybody with, uh, you know, one eye and, and half a brain could conclude that patient beard here probably addressed or rebutted, um, you know, 0.00001% of of all the evidence that I actually provided. Um, it might've just been a, a lack of understanding, so I'd have to forgive them for that. So I might just- a model to present evidence for it. I thought you said all that right, was your gentlemen. last words. That was. Anyways, anyways, gotta, so anyways, I'm sorry. You know, I, I think I just- I've got to stop you, stand, Sandy for truth. I'm sorry, buddy. We've got to, <laughs> I've got to stop you. But totally appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. I honestly hate saying goodbye, because I just, I, you have no idea. This Too is much like the highlight. I don't want it to end. I know. I don't, but to respect your guys' time, I, I should let you go. So uh, for those of you 